We're very fortunate today to have Pro <coughs> Professor Suzanne Chambers with us, who is taking her position at the rostrum. Um, she's, a, uh, she's a great friend of ours, and uh, Pam and I and others got to know Suzanne when she was at the, uh, at the um, Cancer Council Queensland, and what it was called before, and now at Griffith University, and she's still associated with the Cancer Council Queensland. And of course, PCFA has an incredible partnership with both organisations. And uh, as a threesome in terms of organisations, we're a real force to be reckoned with. So it's wonderful to have Susan here. Now, Pam and I, along with others, were very fortunate last week to be at the Queensland Club. I mean, we were fortunate just to be at the Queensland Club at some place. But uh, it was a special occasion where Suzanne was surrounded by her Cancer Council colleagues, her Griffith University colleagues, her PCFA colleagues and a whole lot of other supporters. So um, we are very privileged to have her in Sydney today and this is going to get out to all the support groups in every state and territory in Australia and uh, without any further to do, this is our favourite psycho-oncologist. Suzanne Chambers. Thank you, David. Well, I'm certainly really, really happy to be here. So I thank you all for having me and people who've travelled to get here. I really appreciate that as well. And I understand the parking's really tricky. So that's an extra step for all of you to make it uh, to come today. My disclaimer straight up is that some of this talk is a little bit like the talk I gave last time and some of it is different because I'm focusing on the book that uh, we've just finished together. So apologies for the bit that's a bit the same, um, but I hope that you find this a useful presentation anyway. So as you know, the focus of this is about this book that um, together with colleagues that are associated with the PCFA I've pulled together. And I just want to tell a little quick story about how this book came about. For some years I've had different groups coming to me and saying I should write a therapy book for psychologists and, or a book for nurses or a book for health professionals about how to work with people who are coping with the diagnosis of prostate cancer. And I was at Tamworth last year talking to the support group leadership who were in there for a development two-day workshop. And I was chatting to um, some people who'd been involved in my research about what they thought we should be doing. And then I had a chat to David and Pam and said, well, what do you think I should do? And they said, write a book for us, Suzanne. So I said, all right, then I will. So I set myself to that task, worked at it. And I must say that uh, while I'm the one that gets to have her name on the cover, a really big part of this book are personal stories from people who've been through the experience of prostate cancer. And I really do think they're an essential part of the book and they're what makes it work from the feedback I've had so far. So why facing the tiger? I'm sure some of you have wondered why did she put the tiger on the front? And I guess there's a few reasons for that. One of it is that it brings to mind an image of strength and I think that's something that's important for men who are coping with prostate cancer to have that vision in their minds and important for their partners as well. And the other one is but my urological colleagues are always talking about prostate cancers that are pussycats and prostate cancers that are tigers and so I guess I had that um, analogy in my mind a lot and came up with this title, tested it out with um, men that I knew who'd had prostate cancer and they liked it so we went with it. What's the point of writing a book like this? I think that what's important about it, first of all, is it's an opportunity for me to raise the profile of prostate cancer and the needs of men with prostate cancer and their families. So by doing this book, it's enabled me to get on radio, to get into the financial review, to get into the media and start talking about these issues. And I'm hoping to get the community to talk about these issues more and for men and their families to feel less alone in this experience. I think it's also fair to say that we all know oftentimes men are reluctant to seek support and so I thought that writing something that was a book that you get from a bookstore might be another way that we might be able to get to men and their families who might not feel like they want to necessarily first up ring up a prostate cancer support group. So it's just another way of getting the message out there and it's complementary to everything that you do. So if you read the book, what you'll find is that many of the personal stories, people are talking about the prostate cancer support group that they were involved in and what it meant to them. And at the end of the book, it's got how you get in touch with the prostate cancer support group. So I see it very much as us working hand in hand together to try and improve support for men and their families. So it's raising the profile. 
when I wrote this, I can tell you I wrote it on Saturday morning sitting at my kitchen table and my deal with myself was that after I'd written one to two chapters I could go out and go shopping, which was a really good motivation to get me moving. So I wrote it very quickly because the shopping was quite an incentive. And I tried to write it as if I was using my own voice and talking the way I'm talking to you now. So I've tried to be down to earth as much as I could, pragmatic, but I haven't made these strategies up out of nothing. They come from the evidence of what we know has been found in research and in clinical practice to work. And I've tried to turn them into something that looks like advice that seems reasonable for men and their, their families to consider. The stories and the personal wisdoms that are in this book are an integral part of it. So you'll find when you look through it, there's uh, men of all different, in all different situations and partners in all different situations and even a son talking about their experience and what it meant to them. And I think that's really important because it means you don't just get one person's personal story, you get like 15 personal stories and hopefully most people will find someone there they can relate to. I'm hoping that this book will help people build connections with support groups and with other places that can help them. And I'd like to see that it starts us up a conversation amongst all of us about what we need to do to make things better across the board for men with prostate cancer and their families. So why does all this matter? Well, I'm I know I'm talking to the converted with all of you, but I don't think it hurts us to remember that there's a huge number of men, if you look at that slide, by 2017, 267,000 men will be living with a diagnosis of prostate cancer. That's a lot of men, that's a lot of families, and that's a lot of partners. And so this is a really big issue in our community, and the support of men with prostate cancer and their families is something that everybody should be concerned about. We all know that the psychological experience of prostate cancer is considerable. Lots of research, not telling you anything you don't already know, but it's really common to have heightened distress, to be worried about the future. Treatment decisions can be really difficult. Big challenges to masculinity, and that's not just about sexual changes, that's also about not feeling perhaps that you're as strong and self-reliant as you were before the cancer. Concern about relationships and what the prostate cancer might mean coping with treatment side effects, which you all know very well, worry about family and financial pressures. So across a whole range of different domains, there are difficult things that a person is facing, not just when they're diagnosed, but as they go through the experience of prostate cancer. And so at any time like this, it's really important to have a roadmap, an accessible roadmap to help you with that. This is my, you will have seen this slide from me before, but it's my important point to make that everybody does this differently and that's just fine. There's no one right or wrong way to do this and I make that point repeatedly in the book. To try and encourage people to look at others' experiences and learn from it but not to judge yourself by, that, uh, by how others get through this and to be kind to yourself and to be your own best friend and I think that's really important and being flexible is crucial in all of this. Probably the one most important thing that you can remember is to be prepared to try a different tack if your first approach isn't working. So what are the things that we know about that seem to make it harder to cope with a diagnosis of prostate cancer? Because what we do know is, and I think this is important to note, the vast majority of men, probably about 90% really, over time do just fine in terms of say anxiety and depression and those sorts of emotions. But a substantial proportion, maybe 10%, maybe 15%, don't do so well. So as a psychologist, I want to know what are the things that make it harder for that man. But even for men who are doing very well in terms of heightened psychological distress, many men, about half, report unmet needs for support about fears of worry about the future and about sexuality and about understanding what's happening with the treatment pathway. So well, I guess what I'm saying is that men are pretty resilient to this experience, but there are some things that can make it harder and we need to be aware of that. So what makes it harder? Not having enough understandable and accessible information. So this is something we can do something about. Uh, not having sensible and or experienced support. Again, that's something that all of us can do something about. Feeling isolated. We can take some action on that. Not knowing where to get help. That's something we must take action on. And what also makes it harder is if men and their partners are not talking this experience over with people close to them. So that's something that we can try and create an environment where that can happen, but we can encourage men and their families to do that too. 
Other things that make it harder are being younger. We know that and that makes sense if you think that through. Having less personal resources, so if you don't have the financial resources or the social support resources to help you through. Having more advanced disease makes this tougher. Again, that's pretty common sense. You've got more to cope with and more uncertainty. And having more treatment effects makes it harder. Again, because the challenges that you're facing are just so much higher, that bar is so much higher. So the next point I would make is that prostate cancer is a journey and it's not just one experience. You don't just have the cancer, quickly get treatment and it's all gone. There are things that happen along the way and they all have their own unique and individual challenges. So the first key stress point is of course diagnosis, finding out that news, trying to understand that, trying to get some sense out of what the implications of this diagnosis are and from that making a treatment decision which we uh, talk about a lot, I'm sure you do at support groups and when I'm talking to men and their families, trying to look through what are the options that are available to me and how do I make a decision that I'll be happy with. The next thing is getting through treatment. Often men feel a sense of relief once they've made the decision, oh thank goodness I've got a path going forward and then they have the treatment and then it's coping with the side effects when even when you know what those side effects are and you think you're prepared for them it can still be quite a shock, particularly if those side effects are perhaps more exaggerated than you had anticipated. Then getting back to work, feeling strong enough and ready to face work and being well enough to face work. Getting sex back on track and that in a way that needs to be further up the list because getting sex back on track is something we try and encourage people to think about from the very beginning. And then once you're through all of these things there's medical checkups and that feeling of nervousness when you have to have your PSA done and when the result comes through and, and always that sense of anxiety that can happen. So these are things that are key stress points people have to cope with and I think it's useful to be aware of them because then you can plan for them in advance. Don't let them sneak up on you, plan for them in advance and be prepared. So my approach to this is what I call the toolbox approach. It's that we can walk into a situation and let it wash over us and assail us and, and spin around and try and interact with this or we can say there are things I could do that might make this easy for me. I'm going to find out about those things and I'm going to give them a try and give them a go. And so it's a planful and problem solving approach rather than just letting it fall upon you. It's also an approach that says if the tool that you've been trying doesn't work, you probably need to find another tool. So the idea is to have a selection of strategies that you know you can apply to the situation you're in. If one's not working so well, you can have a go with another one. So developing a toolbox to meet the challenges and I had that very much in mind when I was developing the chapters for this book and this roughly um, goes along with it. Understanding why prostate cancer is difficult and learning strategies to manage stress. Tips for decision making, getting ideas for how to talk about cancer and when not to talk about cancer, how to think about cancer in a way that helps you rather than hinders you, finding a strategy for problem solving for if I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed how can I pull this problem apart and develop strategies for it and then finally setting goals and getting the most out of life because if there's one experience that will bring you back to basics and remind you about what's important to you, cancer is one of those. So making decisions you can live with and I'm picking this one off because this happens very early in the treatment experience although along the way there'll be new decisions that come, come across uh, perhaps for dealing with side effects, if the PSA starts to rise, if something else happens with your prostate cancer. Now why is this so hard? Now having said that, some people find it really easy and I certainly have known some men I would have called expert decision makers who are able to charge their way through this decision. But I've probably known more men who found it really tricky to make this decision and had a great deal of uncertainty. Why is this hard? First of all, you're having to choose between a range of tough options. None of these are options you would choose in normal life and they all have consequences that are unpleasant. So there's no easy, clear option for many people. And then there's uncertainty about what actually will happen. While the doctors can give you risk estimates, which are often almost impossible to understand, depending upon how they're expressed to you, and they're numerical, and not everybody's great with numbers. I am certainly very bad with numbers. 
What this means is that you can have a, a guesstimate about what happens to 100 men in general who have this procedure, but it doesn't tell you what's going to happen to you personally. And that means there is uncertainty always about what might actually transpire. Trying to understand statistics is hard even for health professionals. They make just as many errors in their judgment about statistics in studies than do lay people. So it's hard for everybody, unless you're a person who deals in statistics all the time, and they, of course, know it very well. And medical terms. Every time I've been involved in the development of a book on prostate cancer, it's always ended up with a really high readability level just because the words are so long. Brachytherapy, radiation therapy, hormonal ablation therapy, all of these are unfamiliar terms that most of us would never come across in our normal life. And so you're almost having to learn a foreign language when you're diagnosed. And you're feeling stressed enough already without having to try and cope with this decision making. So what are the tips? And these are tips, that, again, that are in the chapter of the book. It, and this is really condensing it down, of course. First thing is to take your time. There is rarely a need to make a mad rush hurry with your decision. For most men, you check with your doctor, of course, but for most men, there's time to consider your options. Be informed and ask questions. You need to understand, if you can understand what's happening to you, it'll make it easier for you to be involved in that decision to the extent that you prefer. Try and be clear about the pros and cons from your point of view. What matters here, you're the person who's going to have to live with the consequences of your decision. There will be a range of pros and cons with each possible option. So it's a matter of working out from all these pros and cons, which are the ones that matter most to me personally from my point of view. Talk it over with your medical team and your family. Talking things over helps you to process information and check your understanding. And so that's a really important strategy. Take a support person to your doctor's visits. It is really important if you can do this to have someone with you. You've got a second set of ears so that if you've misheard or you've gone into a moment of shock while you're listening to the possible options, you've got someone else there that you can check back with about your understanding. As well as which, if you're in a relationship, this, these decisions are going to affect your partner in some ways as well. So what greater thing can you do than work as a team as you work this through? Talk to someone who's been there before. So if you talk to others, again, their experience will be difficult, different to yours. But if you talk to other people who've been there before, you get a sense of what this is like from a personal point of view, which you can't get from talking to a health professional. And that's where the support groups and the people in the support groups that you can chat to are so very important. And if a second opinion would help, ask for one. Most doctors are very happy to organize a second opinion. And then even if you decide not to take up that second opinion, you can feel like you've turned every stone over, you've had a look at what's under it, and then you've made a decision that you're confident about. Now, this is a model that I've shown in this group before, but I think it's worth putting up because it underpins many of the approaches that I talk about in the book about what things you can do to help yourself. And it's the stress cycle. It's understanding a diagnosis of prostate cancer as a major life stress for both you and for your partner and people in your family. And how this model presents is saying that when you get diagnosed with prostate cancer, you, you will think about it in a certain way. And I'm sure that many of you will remember that point of hearing the news where perhaps first of all your mind went completely blank with shock and then suddenly thoughts about what this meant were rushing into your head. Now those thoughts drive a reaction to the diagnosis. And so and I've, this is one of these things where you get a major life stress, your body produces adrenaline and noradrenaline in response to a threat. It sees it as a threat to your survival and you have a physiological reaction to that. That might mean you might feel short of breath, you might feel tight in the throat, you might suddenly feel sick, have to run to the toilet, you might have sweaty hands, your mouth might go dry. These are all physiological, physical reactions to stress that are caused by your body and your mind telling you that you're in trouble. At the same time, those thoughts and those physical reactions drive an emotional reaction, which could be feeling fearful, feeling anxious, feeling sad, feeling angry. All of these emotions come into play. And then in response to all of that, you'll have things that you do to try and cope with this. So actions that you might take might be withdrawing, going for a 
big walk somewhere to try and clear your head. You might want to talk about it. You might not want to talk about it. You might seek more information. And that's quite an individual thing. Most of us have patterns of coping, patterns of action that we take when we're stressed. And you'll have yours. So it's useful to think about, oh, so what is my typical reaction to stress? And try and understand that. And if you understand it, you can do something about managing it to your own well-being. Because if you think about that model, what that tells us is that you can do something about your thoughts to help you cope better. You can do something about reducing those negative physical reactions. And you can do actions that will help you with feelings as well. And these are just really straightforward strategies that you can apply rather than perhaps just feeling overwhelmed. Now, in the book, I talk about this is ignoring stress as like keeping your foot on the throttle. And I have to tell you, when I was writing that, I have an uncle who's a mad motorbike rider. And I said to him, you tell me what it feels like when you've got your foot on the throttle and you don't let go of it. So he gave, helped me with some of the words so that it was going to sound like it, it ran true. So you're not a mad motorbike rider? I am, actually. But I don't keep my hand on the throttle. <laughs> I'm a little bit cautious on my motorbike. Although the same uncle did help me buy a new sports motorbike. We can talk about that later. Um, but uh, so yes, if you ignore stress, thinking it's just going to go away, what can happen is that you can lose control or just get exhausted, run out of gas, lose control of the vehicle. All those things can happen to you. So what you really want to do is manage the stress so that that doesn't happen to you and so that you're more in control. Ignoring stress can lead to tiredness, irritability, reduced energy, loss of stamina, strained relationships, getting really cranky. All of those things can happen. And you don't want those things to happen because they're not pleasant for you to experience and they're not pleasant for the people around you. So there are tools for what I call de-stressing in the book. And I won't go into these in too much detail, but they're pretty straightforward. Relaxation exercise. Now, I know you blokes often don't like to do those, but if you just learn some deep breathing exercise, there's some faces, I know. And sometimes the best de-stressing you can do is hosing the garden or getting out and doing. So think of things that you like, or playing golf. They're de-stressing exercises. But the good thing about deep breathing, <laughs> not really. <laughs> well, you know, actually, you called me on that because I don't play golf. But I find, I find cycling de-stressing. And I find um, walking up big hills de-stressing because I like the physical things. Everybody's different. Um, with all of these. But the trouble with the walking up the hill or the cycling is you can't do it in the doctor's office. This is, you know, well, it'd be tricky to do that in your doctor's office. So this is where just learning deep breathing exercises, which really do physiologically calm you down, is a really useful strategy. Because if you're stuck in that room and you're waiting to hear what your PSA test is going to be and you're starting to hyperventilate, if you can just calm yourself down with the deep breathing, it will just really help you get in a bit more control and get through it. These, those sorts of exercises are also really good for if you go to bed and you know you, your head hits the pillow, it's full of worrying thoughts, just can't get to sleep. Deep breathing and visualization exercise help clear your mind and focus you on something else and can really help with, with that problem as well. Exercise, we've talk, been talking about that as well. And we know that um, most Australians don't exercise enough. So you can, if you aren't exercising and you get a GP checkup and then you start on an exercise program, not only are you improving your, he your health from a chronic disease point of view, you're also reducing stress. So it's just a complete win-win for you and you'll feel better all around. Hobbies are really great. Again, what hobbies do is they distract your mind from your worries. Uh, sport, that's a big one that hooks back to the exercise. Pleasurable and restful distractions. So listening to music that you really love, reading books. And I know that sounds really obvious, but sometimes you can get so caught up in the illness experience, you can forget to do those lovely things that make you feel good about your life. Mindfulness and focusing on the present is something that we've been doing recently. We've actually got a national trial on, on mindfulness, which is a type of uh, management of stress, if you like, that is sort of rooted in the Buddhist tradition of meditation. And we're running a trial nationally, which people can get in touch with me if they want to know about, for men whose disease has advanced, and uh, testing out to see whether this particular approach can really improve men's quality of life and reduce their feelings of distress. The idea of mindfulness is to, rather than trying to change your thoughts, to get comfortable with your thoughts and feel more 
um, less reactive to what's going on around you and more rooted in the present. So without worrying too much about the future or regret, regretful feelings about the past, really living with what you have right now. Uh, because what we often do is we drive ourselves to distraction, worrying about things that may never come or regretting things that we can't change. Whereas if we just enjoyed every minute, right this moment with the people we're with, we could feel a whole lot better about a whole range of things. Now exercise, big fan of exercise. It's really important for men with prostate cancer. It's really important for their families as well for gen general chronic disease prevention. But particularly if um, a man is on androgen ablation therapy and he's not getting his testosterone there, he's, this is really important for him to maintain uh, bone density and muscle mass. And there's really good data. We're lucky in this country. We have um, Rob Newton's group over at Edith Cowan in Perth who've done this work and really shown that uh, Exercise programs that include high intensity exercise, weight strength, strengthening exercise, and some aerobic activities, properly developed program, really makes a difference in all those particular indices. So this is, I've got no drawbacks at all in saying to you that I think it's a really good idea if you're not doing an exercise program to see an expert and get a program developed for you, and there are great gains just both from a physical health point of view, but also a quality of life and in increasing your uh, levels of vitality and decreasing fatigue, keeping weight under control, all those sorts of things, sleeping better. It's just an all round good pill, basically, exercise. Now, to make, you want to make your exercise count, though, and this is something I've learned from my exercise physiology friends, is that you can do a lot of running about that doesn't benefit you much. And if you're going to put the effort into exercise, get a plan so that you're making it count and making it really work. You've got to get the good to go from your doctor, and I would see an exercise specialist for a personalised program that fits your situation. You really need to have resistance exercise for muscle strength, and, of course, you want aerobic exercise for cardiovascular fitness and weight control. You need a plan of attack, you know, and you need to be doing, doing it with the right advice. And if you can get an exercise buddy, that's even better because you can make each other feel guilty if you don't turn up and keep that peer pressure going to keep you at it. That always helps and makes it more fun too if you've got someone to chat to. So thinking. So if we remember back to the model before, I talked about the importance of how you think. And, you know, if you think about it, think about it. But, uh, our thoughts really drive our behaviour and how we think about what's going on around us really influences our response to it. And what often happens is that the way we think is pretty automatic. There'll be those of us who are black and white thinkers. It's got to be all this way or it's no good. Or catastrophizers, we imagine the worst and get ready for that. We can have negative filters where we automatically see something in a negative light. Self-blame, where we really blame ourselves typically for what goes on. And none of these things are really helpful for us because they increase not feeling so good and feeling worried. We learn them when we're children, as we're by watching those people around us, watching our parents, perhaps we learn them from our peers. And they become automatic, so we don't even realise that we're doing it. So one of the first things that you need to do if you want to have your thinking working better for you is to start being aware of your own thinking patterns. The other thing is not to get too hung up on it though. Thoughts are just thoughts. You know, a thought can't actually kill you. A thought can't actually hurt you unless you respond to it in a certain way. They're just thoughts and they're processing. So to try not to be so reactive to them. Starting to understand our own thinking patterns but not getting too head up about them. Just treating it as a bit of self-exploration about how does my mind work and how do I tend to approach things. When you're finding yourself doing unhelpful thinking, don't be negative about it from the point of view of yourself and say, oh, there I go again, I'm hopeless. It's like, oh, that's interesting. I'm doing that old thinking pattern again. That's maybe not so helpful to me. Treat yourself with kindness and forgiveness and self-coaching and try to be more in the present. So to do this, the strategies, and I'll probably flick through this a little bit because I did talk about it last time I was here, but you've got to identify those thoughts. And if you find yourself at different times of the day feeling unhappy or sad or anxious, try and stop for a moment and reflect and think what was going on in my head right then? What was I thinking about that was maybe driving the way I'm feeling? Sometimes it's helpful to actually write those thoughts down. You don't have to do that but if you write them down it can often detoxify them because when you write it down it can be easy to go oh, that's not realistic. 
that's not helpful. That's not a thought I'm going to keep and I'm going to discard it. If you have a pattern of thoughts recurring, try and notice that so you can work out where is that coming from? What's driving that pattern? Now, there, we call these thinking errors, which I don't like that so much, but that's the word that people tend to use. And these are just examples of unhelpful thinking, so scare tactics. I know if I get treatment, I'll definitely have the worst possible time. Catastrophizing. Everything will fall apart if I can't do everything exactly the way I need to. Self-blame. Feeling bad about feeling unhappy. Blaming yourself and telling yourself that you're weak. Or all or nothing thinking. If my sex life can't be just the same as it was exactly before, then I'm not even going to try. Those are thinking patterns that stop you from trying to solve problems and can increase your sense of distress. So to challenge your thinking, you test your thoughts to see if they are worth keeping. What is the evidence that this is 100% true and correct? Is this a realistic thought? Is this a rational thought? And finally, is it helping me to think this way? And if the answer to any of those is no, then that might be a thought you might consider that you could do better without. So make sure the replacement thought is realistic and helpful. There's no point putting a saying, oh, well, I'm just going to pretend that tomorrow I'm going to wake up wealthy and everything's going to be fixed. You know, that's, that's just not a helpful way of thinking. But trying to think of, OK, well, perhaps if I do this differently, this might happen and I could try this different approach. So believable thoughts that don't have to be positive but have to be realistic and are that encouragement focused rather than being critical. So these are some helpful thoughts, focusing on the positives. I can't worry that something, about something that's never happened. I'll wait and see, and I'll take one day at a time. Having a balanced view. Not being able to do everything I want to right now is probably pretty normal. And it's a bit frustrating, but I can cope with frustration. Reducing self-blame. Telling yourself it's normal to feel upset. It's not the sign of weakness. It's normal reaction to a difficult situation. And focusing on goals. My first priority is to help myself stay well during treatment, and be fair to myself. Now, I put this quote up because I think it's, I, I'm not sure why I put this up, but I like it. And it kind of, to me, this speaks to just sticking with a plan, being patient, and accepting what happens. This is a photo of Steve Bradbury, who uh, won the gold in the 2002 ice skating. I think it's the first time in Australia, and probably the last time Australians are going to win that. But uh, you know, he had a game plan. He just was going to stay close to the group, keep out of the ruck, so he wasn't going to get caught up if they all fell down. And he thought, you know, I'll just stick to it, stick to my tactics. And if one of them goes down, I might get the bronze. But then they all went down, and I thought, I think I've won. And he did, of course. And um, after that, I know a lot of my colleagues, we started talking about doing a Bradbury, which was just having a plan, a realistic plan that matches your cap cap capabilities and sticking to it and accepting what happens. So I just think it's a nice um, example out of the world of sport about uh, ways to approach problems. So these are some quotes that focus now on couples. And this is a quote from Rill, who is 52. And this comes from research I've done years ago. David and I have been married for a long time. We've always had our differences. I'm the type who wants to talk about a problem, and Dave just quietly looks for ways to fix it. Any sound familiar to anyone? When David came home from surgery, he had bad incontinence. I knew he was struggling, but he hardly complained. I found myself putting on a brave face for him and then ducking around to my sister, have a whinge and a cry. So I think it just, it's a nice example of different coping strategies. And I often talk about that, and I, I certainly do in the book. And I know it's, you get into trouble if you stereotype, but there really are differences in how men and women approach uh, illness and approach problems. And uh, it's important to know that and be accepting about that with each other, but finding a way to have a, converse, a common conversation about this so that you can go through this as a team, because that will be your secret weapon for getting through this. Because you're in this together. What, how the man approaches his prostate cancer and how he reacts influences how his partner reacts and vice versa. You're in a system together and so you're not isolated. So you, you really do need to try and approach this as a team. What are the easy tips? Make time to communicate. You don't need to talk about cancer all the time, but you probably need to talk about it some of the time. So coming to an agreement with each other about 
when you're going to talk about it, but other times being able to not talk about it and not focus on it so much. Try not to mind read. In most close friendships and close relationships, we do mind read. And some of the time, we might get it right. We think we know why he's doing or she's doing this and that, because we've been with them for a long time. But some of the time, you might get it wrong. And the trouble is, when we mind read our partners, we act as if this is the truth, and we do know it without checking our assumptions. When in a situation where someone's been diagnosed with prostate cancer, this is a new situation for a couple. So it's important in a new stressful situation to not mind read and to check out assumptions, to check out what each other are thinking and how you can help each other to get through. Trying not to judge each other and be kind and be fair to each other as you go through this. And finally, reminding yourselves of what you share and what matters most between you, which can feel like it gets a little bit lost in the experience of cancer, but to remind yourselves of those things can help bring back a sense of closeness, particularly if you're not feeling so physically close. So this is another quote from Kath, who's 59. What I struggled with the most in the beginning was knowing how to support Alan. It seemed somehow that the more I tried to reach him, the more he withdrew. Although I know now that I was on the right track, for a long time it felt like I was groping around in the dark. And that's where sharing information about what's helpful and what's not helpful, don't have to go overboard, but just keeping in touch with each other about what's happening can prevent you feeling like you're groping around in the dark. And keeping a balance. After surgery, I had six weeks at home. I went from working 80 hours a week and not having enough time at home to spending all my time at home with Ruth. We definitely got closer, but we both felt closed in. I started to feel as if I was losing my sense of who I was, and Ruth started to feel as if I was getting under her feet. So you can see that for that couple, what was important was going to be for them to talk about that and to make some time to be apart and do their own things as well as being together. And showing care. And this quote is about, after the cancer, appreciating each other more and doing little things for each other to show care. And often those can be practical and physical things and reminding yourself selves about why you got together in the first place and what are the things that still bind you together, which often can be family and shared interests. So we're moving on now to the idea of solving problems. And there's a chapter on this in the book that breaks it down. A problem can often seem overwhelming and you don't know where to start. And whenever that's the case, what's really useful is to get some clarity about what exactly the problem is and to break it down into its bits and start systematically to work your way through it. So clarify the problem, seek information so that you understand the issues, generate all the possible actions you could take. So first of all, think of every possible thing you could do, even if they seem a little silly or outlandish, get a big list. And then consider the pros and cons of each different approach so that you can work your way through to come to what you think might be a good approach for you. Be prepared to ask for help and support if you need it. And again, be flexible. You need to be prepared to change tack if what you're currently doing isn't working, rather than sticking at that again and again and getting more disappointed. Get some information, get some advice, and try a different approach. So finally, grace under fire. So Ernest Hemingway in The Old Man in the Sea, which is one of my favorite books, has this great quote, and I have it in a paperweight on my desk that says, courage is grace under fire. And I really like that because it's easy to look great when things are going tough. But when, sorry, when things are going easy. But when things get tough, it's really hard to keep going and to keep a sense of grace about what you're doing. And I think that you should really be, again, easy on yourselves and recognize that prostate cancer is a difficult experience. And you should give credit to yourself for working through this and getting through this experience. Many people talk about these days especially about a diagnosis of cancer in their family leading to a search for meaning and trying to find some good out of this. And it's not, everybody doesn't do it and you don't have to do it. And it's not better if you do or you don't. But I think it's important to recognize that that can be part of the cancer experience. What does need to happen after cancer is to rebuild your identity in some way, either to get back the sense of who you were before your prostate cancer, or maybe you have a sense of being a slightly new person, perhaps a slightly more resilient person, or someone who understands the worries of others in a new way and has compassion for others in a way that you might not have had that to quite that extent before. Whatever it is that you do, you need to choose your own path. But I always think it's nice to share those stories about people who have 
picked up their cancer experience, perhaps done, done some quite amazing things. And this is um, in the book, an excerpt from the last story in the book, from Peter's story. And Peter is a, a man that I admire immensely and that I've known for a very long time. And he, uh, after he had his prostate cancer, he decided that he would climb Mount Kilimanjaro really to show himself that he could get over the side effects of a radical prostatectomy. And he achieved that, which was an extraordinary thing to do. He, he did um, Kokoda as well. Then what he did more recently was decided that he would do Aconcagua, which is an enormous mountain and a very dangerous mountain. A lot of people die there every year. And terrible blizzards closed in, and so he didn't in the end get to the top. But he did find a real sense of uh, peace and being at one with the universe when he went up there. So I think it's an inspiring story for you to read. Now, I'm not suggesting that you all line up to climb Mount Aconcagua. I can tell you, I'm not lining up. I did climb Mount Kilimanjaro because of Peter, because he did it, and I admired him so much. I decided to do it too. I'm not lining up for Aconcagua, though. It's too scary. But it doesn't always have to be climbing a mountain. It can be you might decide that you want to learn a new skill or you want to take up a new pastime or you want to mend a friendship or there might be something that you want to do that's been sitting there in the back of your mind for a long time that this experience leads you to decide that you're going to take on as, as a challenge and achieve. And so that's just another idea for things you might want to do to help you move through this. So. That is the end of my presentation. Now, we've got some copies of the book at the front here for you to see. This book is available at this point in time from the web store of Australian Academic Press. So if people just Google Australian Academic Press, they'll get to the web store. And it's also available from the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia web so website. The royalties of the book do go to the PCFA to help with prostate cancer research and all their important work. So. Uh, I recommend it to you as a good read. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> and so do I recommend it. Now, we've got time for questions. Who would like to be the first? Just a couple of obs personal observations, and if I can get your feedback maybe on these Please, observations. Yes. Um, you talk about the information being available. Um, I found that there is plenty of information available if you're prepared to spend the time looking for it. Um, just a personal observation. Um, the second observation is the biggest problem I had in terms of decision making was contrary advice from the medical profession, mm -hmm. which you didn't mention specifically in there, mm -hmm. where um, I got advice to do something and the other one said 100% not to do it. And that was mm -hmm. the difference between a mm -hmm. surgical and radiation mm -hmm. advice. Um, does that come very, would you like to comment on that? Does that happen very often? Yeah. So I'll go back first of all to the question about information. So if you're very good at looking for information or you're confident in looking for information, there's lots of information there, I would agree. But not everybody is and sometimes the information that's available is hard to understand. So I think we still haven't worked out quite how to do that well. Um, and I think we need to, uh, we're in much better shape from information provision than we were 10 years ago, but I think we've got a ways to go yet. In relation to um, different opinions, that certainly happens that people will talk about that and that is confusing. I think that's where the best thing you can do from a strategy point of view is come down to listening to those different opinions and then working out for the pros and cons which seems to be better for you. So it's in the end there are choices that are probably equivalent in terms of their effectiveness at curing prostate cancer, but they will have a different side effect profile. So to choose between those side effect profiles really depends on what matters most to you and that's where it can be tough. But if you go about it in a systematic way, I think that's the best way to try and get through that. Yeah, I mean that's what you have to do. And in fact, I, in the case I had, I actually went on, online and got um, a lot of website information mm -hmm. to, and people respond and say, yes, somebody's done this and so forth. So, but it's, hard to, but it's hard to do when you do get quite conflicting information. It is difficult. Yeah. It is difficult and it happens um, in any cancer really. But Suzanne, you'd, you'd agree that um, another good um, clarification method is to talk to support group people Absolutely. and link up with people who are, have been through the treatment option that you're considering, yeah. treatment options that you're considering. And uh, it always um, reminds me when I hear comments like that, surfing the net is not a good idea. Um, in unqualified sites. It's a great idea on qualified sites, isn't it? But uh, you, you get a lot of mixed information. Mm. 
don't you? That's that's right. And so we, this is the nice thing to have. If you write a book, you get to decide what sites you put in the back of yeah. it. So I put things that I felt comfortable about. And that was a key for you. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so if people flick to the back, I've just put, you know, the, the books that I thought were good and the websites that I thought were reasonable. And I think you're right, it's, it's being careful about where you take advice from because if you do a Google search, you'll just get millions of hits up and uh, some of it can be quite incorrect. So it's, if you go for um, sites that are from good sources that you can trust, and that's where I think the Prostate Cancer Foundation site is a good starting point, talking to people there. And that's where the support groups are so good because they're sensible. People who've been through the experience know from a personal point of view and they can point you in the right direction. Suzanne, a great to speak, great, great speech. It was wonderful. Um, my operation was most successful. But from a sexual viewpoint, it was a flop. Mm. And uh, it's so disappointing that nothing has been found so that a person can get back into a sexual situation other than the needles and those horrible looking mm. things. Um, can you expand on that? Yeah, look, it's, it's just a really tough one. And there was a study recently out, um, I can't re recall right now, the big study in, uh, I think it was from Europe, just showing long-term disappointing uh, profiles for sexual adjustment for men who'd had treatment for prostate cancer. So what do I think? I think that the goal is to tr for people is to try and be comfortable with and be clear about what they want. So it's not, I've, I'd never say to people, you have to have sex, you have to do whatever it takes to have sex. To me, it's more the goal is trying to get to a point where you're comfortable with whatever sexual relationship you're ha or intimate relationship that you're having. And it is difficult, it's an individual thing. Some men find the injections really straightforward and easy and are happy with the results. And there's a story in the book about a guy who got great results and has been really happy since then. And for others it's a struggle and they don't like it and, and they want it to be different. So what do you need to do? You need to, you know, obviously your partner's got to be part of the decision making process, talking with your partner about what you want to achieve and where you want to get, looking at your options. And it is, we are looking at medical treatments because there's a medical cause for this, it's not psychological. And then uh, together trying to, in a way, use that decision-making strategy that I talked about to come to a decision about what you're going to do about it. And then if you, if you can't resolve it, the, despite best efforts, you don't seem to be getting to a place where you're happy with it, maybe that's where coming back to living in the moment and, and appreciating things in a different way is the, next, is the next step and being comfortable and have a sense of equanimity about where you are and where you're at. Now it's easy for me to say, because I'm standing here and I'm not coping with it, but I guess I've always tried when working with, with men is to say, what's really important is you try and come to the point where you and your partner feel okay about this rather than fulfilling any other goals of any other health professionals or anyone else. It's certainly hard work getting sex back on track for most people. It's pretty hard work and I have colleagues who specialise in this in the US and, and very detailed programs to help couples try and achieve that. Yeah. Yeah. If I may, uh, one of our frustrations is that there's not enough medical specialists, that is urologists and radiation oncologists, that um, really can talk about this sort of situation well. And there are quite a number that specialise in this area. And that's where people like Suzanne and people like us would direct you to these sorts of people. Because from our point of view, you really do need to understand that there are treatment options there that may be good for you, but we're not that confident as we speak that um, all medical professionals put those alternatives out. In fact, we know they don't, because we're all the time trying to encourage them to do so. So you, if you're not getting satisfaction, apart from what Suzanne's saying, you need to get a medical professional that can talk to you about these things. Mm, I, I really reinforce David's point. I mean, this is a specialist business. There's a medical reason for this problem. It comes from treatment, and you want specialist advice from someone who um, knows what they're doing and who understands the situation that you're in. I'm in a situation where I got prostate cancer in 
22 years ago. Uh, Ray treatment for, uh, was held on for five years and then I was put on hormone therapy, Zolodec, and uh, I've been uh, 17 years on Zolodec. Uh, my count uh, stayed about 0.1 for about 10 years and the last uh, period it's slowly gone up but at this stage it's still only reached 0.63. Uh, naturally we're both all in both in our 80s we've been together 22 years since I've got the cancer and uh, a lot of what you put up there is right. Thank you. Okay well it remains for me to um, say on your behalf thank you very much Suzanne it's always great to um, hear you speak because uh, Although to a lot of us things are not necessarily new, it's a reinforcement and Suzanne is one of these rare people who brings out a perspective that we can all relate to and uh, I've heard others say this so it's, I'm not the originating person that's made this statement but Suzanne has this unique ability of listening to people like us and translating it and presenting it in a way that is beneficial to a lot of people going through the journeys that we're going through. So we appreciate all your efforts with this book. We appreci appreciate all your efforts in what you do for the people that are going through the prostate cancer journey. And very importantly, that's not just the men, that's the partners and the families. So on all your behalf, I say thank you. So help me thank Suzanne.